Hey there, I'm Ari from the Tech Buyers Guru and I've got another product review for you here on the channel today. This time around, I'm checking out the new Silverstone ML10 Mini ITX PC chassis just released in August of 2020. Now this is actually the second in a three-part series of videos looking at the latest and greatest in ultra-compact PC cases and coolers. In my previous video, I looked at the Inwin B1 chassis, which was released in summer of 2020. I compared it to the venerable Antec ISK 110, and I found that while it is a little bit bigger, it has a lot more style going for it and also a lot more ease of use. The Antec was really designed around PCs like 10 years ago, and it's really hard to fit current motherboards into this chassis because of the additional shrouds and heat sinks they use. It just is not a fun chassis to work with today. Now, what I'll be focusing on in this review is actually the ML10, which I think improves upon the Antec in a lot of ways, but in some ways it takes a step backward, and I will be explaining that in a moment. Now, in the third video in this series, I'm actually going to be testing a bunch of aftermarket low-profile coolers, and I'm focusing on coolers at 60 millimeters or below. Now, to make this an apples to apples comparison between all three of these cases, I did have to use a cooler that would fit in all of them. And while the Silverstone and Inwin chassis do allow for tall coolers up to 60 millimeters, the Antec doesn't. And I wanted to include this in the roundup because it is such a well-known case that so many people have used over the years. So the only cooler that I could fit in all of these and use an AMD processor was the NHL9 AM4 from Noctua, which stands at 37 millimeters tall. And the reason I'm using an AMD processor is because these cases cannot use add-in video cards. And to get the best all-around performance in an integrated graphics solution, you do have to go with AMD. So I'm using the Ryzen 5 3400G, which actually comes with the Wraith Spire cooler, which stands at 72 millimeters tall. So I couldn't use that at all. I considered using the Wraith Stealth at 55 millimeters, but that would still rule out the Antec chassis. So I decided, well, you know, I really want to include that, and I'm going to go with a cooler that can fit in all of these and use an AMD processor. That's how I landed at the Noctua for this roundup. For now, let's focus on the ML10. Now, what Silverstone did here was take a look at the market, knowing what Antec and Inwin have done over the years, and decide, well, we're going to offer people something like totally different, not a little different, but actually totally different, even though the form factor looks the same. And basically what they're offering is a kit. This case is a kit. It's not really just a case. You actually get a lot of options, but you also have to do a lot of disassembly and reassembly to decide how you are going to use it. I'm just going to show you the pile of parts you get in the box. All right, you get a mount for a slimline optical drive. You get a secondary front panel to extend it to a higher height so you can use taller coolers or SSDs. Here's your SSD tray that sits right above the CPU cooler. And then here's the taller top panel that allows you to use all those accessories. Now, while a lot of people are probably excited about the fact that you can optimize this and customize it to to your heart's content, my concern is that all that modularity comes at the expense of performance because they layer all those trays right on top of your CPU. That makes this case really different from something like the ISK110, which layers its SSDs behind the motherboard. Uh, similarly, Inwin has a BQ656 case that allows you to load a slot loading or tray loading optical drive behind the motherboard. Again, not cutting off the airflow to your CPU. The ML10 gives you all these options, but it cuts off that airflow. And I simply was not interested in testing those configurations. So in this configuration, I could use up to 43 millimeters, but there aren't many coolers that are between 40 and 43. So again, this knock to a 37 millimeter cooler is pretty much the best cooler you can get into this slim line version of the ML10. This is a mini ITX PC distilled to its essence. It's basically not much bigger than the motherboard itself. It's extended in the front to fit. Well, what goes in the front? Hmm, is something missing from this picture? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's the DC board. So one thing you need to consider about this ML10 is like I said, it's a kit. It doesn't come with a power supply and you can't use standard power supplies with it. You have to use a DC board, DC board cabling, and an AC adapter. Now, these were just released. In fact, they came off the assembly line in Taiwan for me. 
These were sent from Taiwan so that I could test this case. They aren't available at retail, but I believe they will be soon. I don't know the price. It's probably going to be between $60 and $80 just for this and the adapter. That's in addition to the $60 for the case. So we're looking at maybe $120 to $140, and that's a 120-watt AC adapter it comes with. So with that said, let's crack open this case. Let me show you inside, and then we'll get into those performance benchmarks. So I'm not going to talk about the installation of the motherboard, which is really straightforward and luckily quite easy in this case. Instead, I'm going to talk about the installation of the power supply, which is a lot more unusual. Here I am installing some standoffs by hand. You do need to do that in order to give space for this DC board, which then is screwed into those mounts, as you can see I'm doing here. Now, that is relatively straightforward, although the manual is a little bit hard to decipher because it's quite small and online only. Now, once you're done installing these screws, you have to do all of the cabling. One cable you probably won't be familiar with is the DC input cable, which does need to be connected to the case and then to the power board. There are tiny screws included with the power board that are used to affix it to the case, as you can see here. And then you attach the cable to the four pin connector on the power board. Note that there's actually a ground wire in the bundle coming from the DC input. And Silverstone has told me the only place to attach this is between the motherboard and its mounting screw. That's the only place you'll get a good ground because the rest of the steel chassis is painted and therefore insulated. The last step is going to be pretty familiar to most PC builders and that involves wrangling the big power supply cables into your case to connect them to your motherboard. Things like that 24 pin motherboard cable, the 8 pin CPU cable which tucks into the corner right over here, and then the jumble of excess cabling including a lot of SATA cables which I do not recommend you use because SATA drives are going to cause a huge airflow problem in this case. As you can see, the SSD drive sled sits right on top of the CPU cooler, and regardless of whether you have any SSDs mounted, there will be zero airflow. The last step will be to affix the top panel. Note that out of the box, it actually comes with the tall front and top panel to accommodate that AMD Wraith Stealth, but I actually switched over to the short front and top panel, which of course is too short to fit this 55 millimeter tall cooler. All right, with this system assembled, it's time to get into some benchmarks. And here we're going to start with idle at the desktop. If you thought the story so far was a little bit complicated, well, the ML10 story is going to get a whole lot more complicated here. I fully expected it to perform just like the Antec ISK110 because it looks so similar and it is practically the same size. Unfortunately, the truth is it was a much worse performer, both with the short top and the extended top. And what really caught my eye here at idle was how high the chipset VRM and M.2 drive temps were versus the other cases. Yes, the CPU temp is high as well, but it was on par with the Inwin B1. Those others are really out of proportion. And I was very concerned there was actually something wrong with my system. Now, once I got to the CPU-Z stress test, I was actually somewhat relieved, even though the chipset and M.2 drive temps were still by far the highest in this test because they didn't go that much higher than they were at idle. Now the VRMs are still quite a bit hotter than in the other cases, and the CPU is slightly hotter than it is in the Inwin B1, which of course has a glass panel in front of its CPU cooler. And interestingly, in this test, once I went with the extended top on the ML10, results really weren't any better. In fact, the CPU was significantly hotter at 81 degrees, and that's because the CPU cooler actually has to reach further for that fresh air. It's further from that mesh panel. It just doesn't work out right. So overall, this did not impress me. And frankly, once we got to 3D Mark, it was literally game over for the ML10 with the extended top. The PSU shut down over and over again. It was getting too hot, which increased power draw just enough to trip that 120 watt AC adapter. Now with the short top, it was able to complete my testing and it actually came close to matching the Antec case overall, although the CPU temp was higher and the noise level was much higher as well. Now I shared these results with Silverstone and they confirmed my suspicion that one of the main differences between these two similar cases is the finer mesh that covers a greater surface area on the Antec. Another issue is that the Silverstone traps a lot of its PSU's heat inboard because it is mounted in the front of the case where there's no venting. All right, if you made it this far into the review, you probably have a sense of how I feel about the ML10, but let me share a little bit of my history with this case to explain why I'm fairly disappointed in the outcome. Several years ago, I came to Silverstone and said, you know, the Antec ISK110 is one of my favorite cases ever, but it really needs some updating for modern PCs. Why doesn't Silverstone take up the challenge, given that Antec has seemed to abandon this project? 
Well, at the time, Silverstone said, we're not really interested in that market. We don't see a lot of growth potential. We're going to focus on other things. And I thought that was the end of the story. Then lo and behold, at CS 2020, they announced the ML10, and I was head over heels. I actually named it my favorite case at the Silverstone booth. Once I got it into my hands, I fully expected it to beat the Antec in every possible way. Unfortunately, that was not to be. Now, I'm going to talk about the highs and the lows of this case, and then I'll give you my conclusion and also what I hope Silverstone will take from this in terms of going forward with the ML10 line. So first of all, the highs. You do get more cooler clearance, and that is important for AMD's APUs. And I specify APUs, of course, because their CPUs don't have built-in graphics. So the only APU that they currently sell at retail that includes a cooler that fits in this case is the Ryzen 3 3200G with the Wraith Stealth Cooler. Now, I tested the Ryzen 5 3400G, which includes a Spire cooler that's too tall for this case. So I still needed to use a different cooler for that processor. And as I showed, it was also too high wattage a processor to use with a system like this. 120 watts is an improvement over what Antec is offering with the 90 watt power adapter, but it's still not enough for modern CPUs with built-in high-end graphics. AMD is really pushing the limits, and the Ryzen 5 3400G clearly tipped the limit and push the built-in power supply over the edge and cause it to shut down on multiple test runs in my benchmarks. I think for the Ryzen 5 3400G, you need at least 150 watt external adapter. And for some of the other 4000 series APUs that may be coming to retail in the future, you're probably going to want even more than that. So ultimately, it feels like, you know, this was a moving target and Silverstone kind of lost track of where the current market is in terms of coolers, which are mostly above 60 millimeters tall, and then also power supply requirements. 120 watts is really cutting it too close. Now, look, you could go in here and use a Core i3-10100, you could use Pentium CPUs, but you know, you could have done that with the Antec 10 years ago. And I would love Silverstone to come up with a revision of this case. I would love there to be two SKUs, one with the lower lid, one with the higher lid, both including power adapters, perhaps different wattage power adapters that are more in line with what you might actually put in the system. So if you want to use the higher lid, 120 watts just isn't going to cut it. Unless they can get a 150 watt power adapter that will work, why bother? You, if you're going to put a CPU in there that needs a taller heatsink, it's going to draw too much wattage from the 120 watt power adapter. Uh, the other thing is I'd love them to update this mesh. This mesh is just not high quality enough. I know they were probably thinking about structural integrity during shipping, during handling. I understand that. You know, you don't want your, your case to crush under load, but you also have to get the airflow in, otherwise your system won't work. All right, so that's a pretty critical element of the design. So ultimately, if I were to give this case a score, it would be three and a half out of five stars, and that would be generous in my opinion. This is a work in progress. I see potential, and I look forward to the next revision. If you have any comments or questions, which I'm sure you do, post them down below. I'll be sure to get back to you. If you enjoyed the video, please do like and subscribe. That means a lot to me, and I will catch you next time.